Very good evening. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome to session four. Uh, the topic of session four is quite interesting and exciting. So I hope you will stay through with us, and we leave together to brave the traffic <laughs> till the end. So stay with us. Uh, so session four is on improving the quality of education, beginning with the educationalist and polishing the system. So it's quite an interesting topic. Uh, I'm honoured to be chairing this session with such prominent educationists whom I have also uh, had the privilege to work with over the years. The synopsis that has been given for this, season, uh, for this session is as follows. Matters relating to the quality of education, level of English proficiency and competency of teachers and school administrators have frequently been discussed as each human being want the best for their children. To do this, students need to be in the best learning environment to excel. In the pursuit of improving quality education, the trust school model has proven most effective in transforming schools and improving the quality of education. How can the trust school model be adopted by other schools in Malaysia? What are the systemic issues holding back such changes from taking place. So I would like to use this opportunity on this session to tap on the experiences and reflections from our fellow panelists who have all collectively have deep and wide experiences in enabling system change in education in our country. And uh, in scoping this discussion, I would like to first define uh, system change and what that really means so we are all on the same page. Uh, and I'd like to just quote from an uh, excerpt of an article that I read recently uh, from Forum for the Future. And I quote, A system is a set of elements interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behaviour over time. Systems can be tiny, like microorganisms, or huge, like an entire economy. They can be naturally formed or created by us. System change is a deliberate, deliberate process designed to transform the system's fundamental behaviours so that a new, sustainable pattern can emerge. Achieving this kind of long-term transformational change at both the scale and pace that is needed is incredibly hard. There are no silver bullets, there's no one individual, business, government or community who are able to do it alone. Simply put, it takes time with different actions from different actors operating at different levels." Unquote. So it's interesting that we are at the, uh, at the end of this session and I hope that we could at least unravel some mysteries around system change uh, that, that is localised uh, and uh, real, real, you will hear real stories from all of our panelists who have had um, real life experience in driving uh, education reform or transformation in the country. So, on our panel today, if I may uh, quickly introduce our panel very briefly, uh, we have Dr. Noor Azima Abdul Rahim, chairman of the Parent Action Group for Education. Dr. Azima and Paige has been quite vocal on various issues relating to student and parent interest in education since 2008. Uh, Datin Azima was named the age 10 inspiring Malaysians in 2013 and also part of the MOE's National Education Advisory Council from 2018 to 2020. So I've actually summarized uh, illustrious uh, CVs. I hope you don't mind that I've just picked and choose excerpts from your CV. Uh, Datuk Satina on my right. Um, is Malewa Learning Resources and President of the Malaysian Association for Education and a former member of the National Education Advisory Council. Uh, Datuk Satina, of course, ha has had an illustrious career in, ed in education sector, starting off as a teacher herself and serving in the Ministry of Education most of her career. Um, and currently, Datuk Satina sits on the board of various renowned international and private schools and was also part of the MOE National Education Council, as mentioned earlier, in, from 2018 to 2020. On my left, I have Ms. Nina Adlan-Disney, Executive Director, Strategic Impact Lead Services, 
Uh, Nina has over 30 years of experience in the Malaysian education sector. Started her career as a lawyer uh, in London and KL. <laughs> and uh, before taking on a variety of leadership roles in a wide spectrum of learning and development field, including the CEO of Asia Pacific Schools and Malaysia Airlines Academy. And currently, the ED for Lip Ed Services, who is the uh, key developer of the Trust School program in Malaysia. And finally, on my left, I have Ms. Jezreel Go, Country Director of British Council Malaysia. Um, Jezreel joined British Council in June 2004, where she led UK's largest education marketing and partnership initiatives in mainland China. Uh, Jezreel brings a broad sphere of experiences in the areas of brand management, corporate planning and investment, as well as international education consultancy. Okay, so without much ado, I would like to start with uh, Datin Azima. I have a question for you and then you can kick off. So shifting culture, mindsets and behaviours are one of the key strategies to system change, as well as the hardest of all the system change strategies and potentially the most powerful. It is how we profoundly shift the big picture, context in which the system operates, and in doing so, shift culture, mindsets, and behaviors. Page has been relentless in its quest for better English proficiency and other pertinent education advocacy in the country. You have also been part of the National uh, Education Council, technically a seat at the table, to influence policy outcomes. So what are the successes achieved thus far and what are the challenges in your own reflections? Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, just quickly looking at the brief here. It says here matters relating to the quality of education. The, f the, the, the fact that the word quality of education assumes that there is quality of education being practiced in the national school system. Unfortunately, I, I, after you know, watching the um, system grow from since Page was established in 2008 until now, and also being in the advisory council of the minister, I'm afraid there is not so much quality in education as the Ministry of Education wants it to be. So if you put your child in the national education without any extra effort from other parties such as tuition, or being in boarding schools or, or otherwise, um, your child will probably uh, come out mediocre. Whether this is uh, a deliberate attempt by some parties, I'm not sure. But this is what is going to happen unless the parent is willing to invest money in the child to ensure that the child has an edge. Uh, secondly, um, level of proficiency. I think we have come a long way. Um, at least no one talks about colonialism anymore. And um, we've had our, with, with cross, cross paths with, you know, Perkasa and Dewan Basa and all that, and, uh, and Abim, etc. And I think they've, after what I've said to them, they've stopped comparing us to Korea and Japan and China. I think they realize now that English is actually important. It's whether the teachers are ready or not. So this was one of the questions I posed to the Ministry of Education as we finished our 22 to 24 month uh, leg with the ministry. I told them with when science, maths and English was um, introduced, the teachers they had to flip-flop on that because that policy because they said the teachers were not ready. So when um, we came out with the dual language program a few years later, uh, we're still hoping that they increase the numbers of dual language program schools um, as, we, as we move on. But it's been painful and, 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 and uh, painstaking because they're not making public the number of DLP schools uh, as they open up, which is probably because, again, teachers are not ready. And um, maybe they are too far and few between that they, not, they, do, they do not um, uh, want to make the numbers public. So again, it is a question of when will the teachers be ready? So now that we, we've gone post-pandemic, I was, had the 
honor of well, we all had the honor of staying home for the past one year, but I had the privilege of watching over the Stand Up 5, Stand Up 4 and Stand Up 5 student last year and this year who was um, in my home. So I would watch the online classes and actually sit in every online class just to see how the teachers are doing. Unfortunately, some of the bad habits that were um, adopted by teachers such as absenteeism have been uh, not punctual to class and shortchanging the students still carried on online, which meant that instead of a whole uh, using a whole hour of uh, class utilized for that subject, they would probably use maybe 20 minutes. And instead of teaching uh, student face to face, uh, what they will do is probably just put on an activity or a quiz which the child will use in 20 minutes and wasting the next 40 minutes teacher will not even attend the class and the kids will be waiting for, waiting for the teacher to, to come and when she does the following week, there's not even an apology. So what kind of values are you teaching the child? So it's great that, you know, in our earlier session, the university uh, universities uh, earlier were very mystic. I'm not too sure about schools. I'm actually an optimist but what i've seen in the past few years i'm not very optimistic in fact quite pessimistic about the way things are going i think the problem is not us but it's the problem the, is the ministry ministry of education which doesn't think that there is a problem so unless <laughs> until the ministry realizes that there is a problem we're not going to go move very far but i but with the covid post covid i think this is the time uh, better than ever to make significant changes uh, in the style of teaching, um, the curriculum itself, and I, I truly hope that uh, you know the the Timbalan Pengarah earlier said that there will be uh, we can expect new things to be happening in schools, waiting for something or other to happen, and I think I also hope that when uh, MCMC launches its jandela and completes the project. Uh, I, I hope to see some serious uh, blended learning and uh, technology being brought into schools uh, for the teachers to utilize because learning, as we all know, it's, it's restricted to the four walls of the classroom, but beyond that. So, um, and I, I, I also, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a great advocate also of um, trust schools and I don't see why uh, trust schools have been in the picture for so long yet the ministry is not welcoming it with open arms you know it's, it's a good product it's a local product and it's been tried and tested so and, and so we need ministers and top management of ministry of education who are open to the idea of trust schools see the benefit of trust schools and then let's let's implement it and keep it going. So I don't I don't see why they are um, uh, not giving the support that they should if they are really serious about um, uh, not producing any more mediocre students. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Datin Azima. I think you brought up certain uh, quite important points. Uh, and one of the things that I hope will come back is really around confidence of digital learning and teaching, actually. I think um, the issues that we have with, with uh, retraining teachers and all of that, keeping them up to speed, it's kind of like compounding. And then now we have this whole digital disruption and how do we build the confidence? I mean, to be fair to the teachers, they've also been caught off guard. I mean, all of their curriculums are, um, are physical and now they have to shift, but it just goes to show that the problems are just getting bigger. Uh, you know, forget about DLP now, there are <laughs> so many also other things that we need to look into. Um, I wanted to just quickly shift to Dato' Satina, Dato um, I wanted you to kind of uh, touch a little bit about collaborations and partnerships because 
um, that is quite a key strategy and component uh, to enable system change. And you've been quite instrumental through a private public sector partnership in some of the work that you're doing. Um, so if you could just share with us your experience and, and also your experience with the Education Council, Advisory Council in the last two years. Over to you, Ritu. Thank you. Does it work? Okay. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tan Sri Michael Yeo as well as uh, his team uh, at KASI and also NAPE and MATKU for inviting me and giving me this opportunity uh, to, view, to actually to present a little bit of my points uh, on, uh, I think Shahira has asked me to talk about PPP, Public-Private Partnership. Um, I think the whole morning today we heard a lot of things and the PPP words has come out uh, quite a few times, uh, including that, that was uh, mentioned by Tansri. Uh, I think uh, Datuk Paramjit also did mention as well. Um, I, I also like to re-emphasize, re within the last few years, we can see the changes, the fast-paced uh, changes that has taken place, uh, not only in the system of education itself, uh, I wouldn't say the system, but what is happening in the, in the education ministry. But also we see uh, a number of, I like to use the word upset or disruption of uh, different ministers that come in. The, the merging and uh, demerging of the ministry. Uh, we like it or we don't like it, Th these are disruptions. So within two years, uh, Datin Azima and myself were in the... Uh, Council from August 2018 until end of July 2020, we have had three ministers. We serve three ministers, different ministers. Um, of course, uh, we work very hard in, uh, in uh, putting some proposal uh, together so that we can put forward to, uh, to the ministry and suggest. I think, uh, as you all know, there are 11 of us and uh, many of us come from different backgrounds. So uh, one of the things that we put forth actually was a PPP, Public-Private Partnership. So having three ministries, you can imagine, but uh, the fact that we were not really uh, bothered about that, we had more than 90 meetings and syndication to come out. And uh, I, I'm proud to say that there is a small report that finally came out. We just got it recently. Um, that also put, uh, include uh, the PPP as well. So the reason why I would like to mention about PPP because I think this is one of the most fundamental aspect that the Ministry of Education need, they need to leverage. Uh, yeah, my premise today actually more on K-12 education, not higher education. So we need to leverage this because there are so many um, big companies, GLCs, who are very willing to come in and they have been doing this for a number of years. Uh, when we actually did this proposal to the Minister of Education, that time was uh, Dr. Masli. Uh, I did a lot of uh, sort of an uh, interview and a uh, kajian a bit, and we found out the amount of money spent by certain companies are just exorbitant. Not to talk about Kazana National and their partners. Uh, I think they have spent millions, hundreds of millions. So, when we have this amount of money, when we have uh, such a big, such actually generous people to come and work together with the ministry. So the word partnership plays a very important role. What is partnership? The word collaboration is another aspect. So we need to define what we mean by partnership. Partner means you should have almost equal, um, I wouldn't say power, uh, equal ways of looking at things whereby the win-win situation will actually will emerge. Uh, personally, I do not see this. Uh, personally, I openly, which uh, we mentioned it, the team mentioned it in our report as well, that, um, that actually sometimes when uh, these big companies, the CEOs coming to see the Ministry of Education, I, I have been in the Ministry of Education for a long time, um, they are treated, I use the word beggars. They are sometimes being asked to wait for an hour 
to mean a very junior officer. What does it mean? So I, I truly feel very sad, but of course, uh, by virtue of me being the senior there, I could tegut to go the orang lah, you know? I could tegut to go and mention to them, these are big short people. They are bringing uh, big pockets to your, to your ministry. So let us leverage on that instead of uh, all the time we are guarding the turf. I, I, I like to mention a little bit that education actually is no longer owned by the Ministry of Education in the context of K-12. Education actually is open now. The roles must be played by the society, by the community, by the public sectors because they are going to be the final, um, what do you call this, uh, owners to our, to our citizens that we train and they will go to higher education. So let me share with you a little bit some of the things that we pointed out to the ministry, uh, I think on the PPP. I did mention actually, data is another aspect. We can't get data from Ministry of Education or any other ministries. So it is totally uh, guarded. So when we have no data, each one of the companies will be using different set of data to go and do their work. So when there is no proper uh, structured way of monitoring who are doing certain things, so you tend to waste a lot of resources. You're not leveraging fully. And then secondly, we also do not see this type of uh, um, welcoming or positivity uh, from some of them, not all of them. Now things have changed tremendously. Things have changed tremendously, but still not good enough because at the end of it, the Ministry of Education themselves needs to make the changes. The Bahagian Sekolah Harian, BPSH, used to have only three officers managing hundreds of millions of money, and they are not trained to do PPP. You know, they are not trained at all. So we suggested they should be trained, probably they could, they could work with uh, UCAS for a while, understand what PPP is all about. So these are the things that is not being, uh, being used. And uh, one more thing that, was, um, that, was, uh, that I thought we brought it uh, quite a bit, the communication aspect of it. So when we are not communicating properly, when we feel that outsiders, outsiders, inverted commas, are not an authority in education, then we tend to fail to understand we are not the sole ownership of education. So I have been hoping that uh, this uh, mindset would change, yeah? this mindset would change. And um, when we have this type of mindset, when we change a lot of things, and uh, we, we, we already talk actually to the ministers uh, openly, uh, and uh, there are some changes, uh, some changes in the Ministry of Education. Now they have bigger, uh, more people in the ministry, but notwithstanding that, I think not good enough. Because at the end of it, uh, I remember before we left, they wanted to set up a sort of a proper committee that will involve private sectors, uh, persatuan like MAPKU and NAPI to come in and to help uh, facilitate PPP. So I can't, I don't know whether I have time a little bit. So I think one thing that uh, all of us should understand actually, there is no point for 10 big GLCs to come in if they themselves are not actually being, uh, being told what actually that you can do. Te because when they come in, they can do a lot of things. For example, I was very involved with Pinta Foundation. Pinta Foundation have adopted over 500 schools in doing actually uh, CPDs. I was involved with uh, Kazana as well, an amazing uh, transformation program that has been done. And now I'm with Malewa Learning Resources, we have adopted, actually we have done what we call it as best project as SMK Kiara Mas. We spent half a million teaching English and we have seen the results for the last two years. So, we are, actually we don't look for recognition from the ministry. What we want actually, welcome us, facilitate us and be happy together for the sake of our children. It's not about us anymore. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think you spoke about the power imbalance, which is really real. <laughs> uh, speaking from a private sector that's actually worked uh, a lot with the Ministry of Education, I think 
that sense of power imbalance is always there instead of looking at each other as equal partners in looking at the best outcome, student outcome and school transformation that we're all uh, trying to contribute together. So uh, I wanted to then, so then my next two speakers uh, are individuals uh, and institutions who have done quite a lot from the private side, contributing to education reform in the, in the country. Um, and if I may also take a little bit of time to talk about the trust school, you know, I, I have been in Kazana since 2006 and was part of the team. Uh, and indeed, it is perplexing 10 years down the road. And I think the idea of the trust school was to demonstrate a model uh, using the existing structures, same curriculum, same school, same textbook, same teachers, can we have a better student outcome? Essentially, that's what Trust School was all about. Um, and what the private sector said they will can help with is to invest and demonstrate, can it be done? So it's a demonstrative model uh, for public school transformation in the country, which Nina will speak about. And, and uh, I think the total investments, not just from Kazana, but also from other large conglomerates in the country, uh, is to the tune of about 600 million ringgit, including two social bonds that were issued behind the Trust School program. Huge investments trying to uh, demonstrate a model of public school transformation. Um, so with that, I will pass you to Nina, who's going to tell you where we are right, right now. And I think... Uh, for system change, sometimes we bring in a dis disrupt disruptive model or innovation, and essentially that's what Trasco aimed to do. Um, and so I'm going to pass on to Nina to maybe share some of the journey and also the challenges to that. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Oh, can you all hear me? Okay, now can you hear me? Okay, and I'm going to be the proverbial not the sage on the stage, right? Because 21st century learning is now about being a guide on the side, right? <laughs> okay, so as Shahira said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Trust School journey and what have been some of the systemic challenges that we have faced, which have prevented the Trust School from maybe being having an even wider impact. So I do have some slides. Can I just have my slides, please? Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of them, but I, I do believe this will be uh, distributed and circulated to everyone later. So let me just focus on a few things. If we go to the next slide, okay, I, I won't do the PR piece, but enough. Suffice it to say that, as Shahira mentioned, Leap Ed was set up to be the designer, developer of the trust and deliverer of the trust school model. It was established by Kazana, as she has mentioned, and in fact, in the same year, uh, Teach for Malaysia was also born, right? Uh, yes, and there were three educational initiatives that were kind of provided uh, seed funding at the time, right? You had uh, Yasan Amir, Teach for Malaysia, and LIPED. Okay, but after 10 years, I just have to say, a new development is that after 10 years of investment, Kazana has handed over the baton to us, so last year, myself, together with the management, I've got Conrad here, who is one of the original uh, founders, the founding fathers of uh, LIPED. Uh, we have actually been given the responsibility to take LIPED to the next stage. Now, whether or not some frustrations with system have, you know, a role in that, I don't know, I wonder. But whatever it is, uh, we are tasked now, we will continue, we will push on with the Trust School program, but we have to pivot as well. Yeah, we have to pivot because we have to do uh, things beyond the Trust School program. And after 10 years of intervention, we have a lot of learnings, a lot of things that we can do beyond the Trust School. Okay, so what exactly is the Trust School? I'm not going to go through this. A lot of people have already spoken about how education is changing, you know, the, the, the UNESCO's uh, 2030 agenda, of course, you've got the UN's SDGs, people have talked about the uh, World Economic Forum. So all of those things come together 
But what we've tried to do in the Trust Group program is to contextualize it to a Malaysian context, building on the aspirations of MEB, the Malaysian Education Blueprint, which is a fantastic blueprint. Some countries have copied our blueprint wholesale. They just changed the picture and it's become their blueprint. So it's a fantastic document. But like many things in Malaysia, where do we fall down? Implementation, right? So that's what we've tried to do with the Trust School program. We've taken the concepts and ideas which are already there. Yeah? So I agree with Dati Nazima. Yes, it is very disappointing. But I have to have hope. Because if I didn't have hope, I wouldn't be standing here today. So I have the optimism, and we, the team at LIPED, shout out to the team at LIPED, we have the conviction that there are many people like yourselves who want to bring to life the aspirations of the blueprint and make them come alive and not just words on a wall or, or text in a book. Okay, so how do we do that? Bearing in mind time, our theory of change and what we do in the trust school cuts across all dimensions, obviously with students at the center. We work with teachers to improve the quality of pedagogy in the classroom. We work with school leaders, not just the Pengetua Guru Besar, but we create those teams, yes, yeah, senior leadership teams, the SLT, to allow great teaching to take place. Do you know what? There are some fantastic teachers in the system. We have seen them in 92 of our trust schools. But most times the problem, can you guess what is the problem? What is putting teachers, great teachers, not allowed to, to be good teachers? Yes? Um, no, not so much parents. It's not curriculum. Yeah, people always say, oh, the problem, Malaysia. Uh, we don't think that curriculum is the key lever of change here. We go into a school, we take the existing curriculum, the existing students, the existing teachers, the existing pangatwa. What is holding great teaching back? Dr. Ramjit. Okay. You know, I wish that it, it were money, because if it were money, it'd be easy, we can fix that. It's, it's more intangible than that. What is holding back great teaching, great teachers? Come on, Sin Seng, you must know. Culture, thank you. It's system, it's system culture. It's the f teacher next door, say, apa lah you nak tunjuk pandai ni? Just buat je lah. Just teach the exam. What we're not prepare, you know, do lesson planning and all that. And then it's showing them up. So this, to me, is the key issue in our system. It's culture which doesn't like outsiders coming in. We are seen as outsiders because we come in with a team. We bring international best practice. They don't like outsiders coming in. They don't like us, you know, helping or what they see as, you know, menambah beban, because now they actually have to do their job. But we're not actually menambah beban. Actually, they're just doing the tugas that they should be doing in the first place. But it's perceived as menambah beban, right? But having said that, although there may be resistance at the beginning, you will be amazed at how the good teachers in the system will just come into their own when they become a trust school. Because we provide that environment that will allow great teaching and great teachers to flourish, right? So I think one key problem issue with the system is that they bring in a lot of programs, but it's never evaluated. And if you keep planting a flowers and it doesn't grow, you chabot, you put in a new plant, but you're not actually looking at the soil, you're not looking at the Rain, you're not looking at the sun. So when we do culture change, that's what we're doing. We're creating the environment for great teaching and learning to take place, for distributed leadership to take place, for, 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 for schools to be empowered to make decisions 
that made sense to them, for their schools, for their communities, not waiting for some, you know, puncha kwasa and some directive to come down from JPN or BPSH or wherever it is. Yeah? So these are the key system issues, yeah? Quality assurance. This is another issue. We have to be truthful, like Datina Zima says. Let's have proper data and proper baselining. You can only get better if you admit that there's a shortcoming in the first place. Kalau semua orang short sendiri, we're never going to get anywhere. So these are some of the things that we do using the existing tools and instruments like SKPMG2, but we use them in an authentic way to tell the story and to encourage great teaching and learning in our schools, which is taking place. So not 100% opt optimistic, but not 100% pessimistic either. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. I think we, we will have uh, quite a lot of questions later potentially on, on the trust school and some of the learnings that we've had. And finally, I'd like to invite our last speaker, Jezreel. Um, you bring a global perspective um, and influencing system change, adoption, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think we wanted to bring it also to the conversation with the pandemic. Um, and this whole uh, drive and move towards uh, digitization, digitalization of education. We're talking about online, blended, and, and everything, but at the, at the heart of it uh, is humanity and, and you know, there are questions on the role of teachers and so on and so forth. So I thought uh, Jezreel has had quite um, an extensive experience um, in looking at these issues and over to you, uh, for you. Thank you, everyone. And I must admit, sitting here amongst uh, very, very experienced practitioners, policy influencers, it's, it's, um, I feel like a real fake here. But So forgive me if I'm not really making sense of what I'm trying to say here. I think um, perhaps I'll take the angle of um, the impetus behind um, modernization and transforming our education system. And um, as we go on with this transformation and with modernization, I think we need to remember that uh, we are probably, and it can be argued that possibly this is the fastest rate of change we have ever encountered, but also we are living in the slowest rate we will ever see. Future generations, our children, may well be faced with ever more disruptive digital developments and rapid transformation to their daily lives. And we need to strive, I think, for balance in the impact these major changes will bring, ensuring that our education systems and curricula are fit for the modern industrial and digital society, but not forgetting the human side of technology as one of the core and central um, element of the modernization of our education. I think that getting this offer right, ensuring that the system through which knowledge and skills are delivered are fit for purpose, ensuring access, these are really essentials to prepare our young people um, to make them feel a part of their society and in creating active, engaged citizens. So when disruption comes at a pace from anticipated areas such as digital innovation or unanticipated areas such as the pandemic that we are still actually still ongoing, I think the modernization of our education system is a pressing need. But not one that we can address as just one country, but it's something that we all need to work together as part of a global education community. So bring, being able to bring in learnings from other countries, being able to admit that perhaps we are not doing so well, and perhaps we really need to adapt, learn, adopt from other countries, I think it's really, really important. And, and for me, the other thing that is really, uh, really, really, I think, quite crucial is the fact that uh, 
education is no longer just about knowledge acquisition, but it must be about offering a very well-rounded education for a world where the competition for jobs will increasingly be worn by those who have taken time for the development of skills, communications, creative thinking, flexibility, and whose skills in language, culture, social science, and more will enable more productive interactions amongst human beings. As our previous, at, during the previous session, one of the speakers talked about humanities. And I think that this is really important, the fact that we are all, and a lot of government are prioritizing STEM, prioritizing technology, and actually neglecting the fundamental of how we build society, and that is human interaction, humanities, the learning of social science. So equipping our teachers, I think, to be able to not just teach technical subject, but that they are able to commit to a people-centric approach is really important. That they are able to prepare our young people to lead an exciting future with ambition, with leadership, and with humanity. Because that is actually going to be real premium in a world where um, it's going to be more uh, virtual than physical for a lot of our kids. So I do think that um, in, in working towards this, um, this change, whatever it is, you know, PPP and trust school, if we want to make this work, it has to be more than buzzwords. It has to be about committing and working together to ensure that um, we bring in existing, we bring in future global resources and address it together um, as, as, as a nation, you know, as society. Because without that, actually, we are not fundamentally addressing the issue that the world is really changing very quickly. And if we don't equip our kids with the ability to, to adapt to um, dealing with physical, not just the virtual worlds, to cope with challenging literacy practices in future work, working contexts, and to adapt to new ways of writing, speaking, communicating through different media, I don't think we will be successful. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Jezreel. You brought a very pertinent point on uh, not forgetting the human aspect in education when we get too busy with other things around education. Um, so you've heard from all of our panelists. Um, uh, I wanted to see if there's uh, any questions, I think, uh, uh, that Nazima spoke about um, the, the quality of uh, education and uh, teacher readiness uh, and for change to really happen uh, individuals and institutions need to acknowledge that there is a problem. Uh, so if we don't acknowledge that there is a problem, then how is change actually going to happen? Uh, Dr. Satina talked about private-public sector partnership uh, and some issues around power imbalance. Nina um, um, touched a little bit on the culture for change. Uh, and uh, we just heard from Jezreel. So I just wanted to open the floor uh, it's quite diverse topics that we have just scratched at the surface, to be frank. <laughs> so, any questions from the floor? Hi, good evening, ladies. Uh, all of you are power women, I can see. <laughs> um, very glad that, uh, to hear so much of, uh, from all of you so passionate, either as a parents or citizens of the country, um, definitely is uh, very eye-opening. I have two points over here. I'm not sure which one I should go first. Um, never mind, I go by the flow that I wrote uh, during the speech itself. The first one is, if you were, if you were the minister, if you were the director general, 
um, and which that you can influence the entire education in this country significantly. Which are the two areas that you will start first? Sure. Which are the two areas? I tried to say one, but I, th I thought that there would be more than one. And neither do I want to say three. I just pick which are the two areas do you think that you will start first? That's my first point. And I'll keep the second point depending on your, re uh, your response on the first point. Thank you. Um, definitely for me, it has to be proficiency of the English language. It is so important. And secondly, maybe it has to be the teaching of values. Um, <coughs> as for me, thank you for that uh, question. It's really great that I, I don't want to be the DG, I want to be the minister. Then only you can change, otherwise you can't change. I think the first thing that I, I would say, uh, when, when, because this is in relation to when we did the education blueprint in uh, 2012, 2013, the most fundamental aspect of uh, education transformation or system change for that matter, actually the role of teachers and leaders. So if I, if I have the power to do it, I would change. I would put the best leaders in all schools and teacher training institute. And then, then, then we have to basically blast their mind into mind change. You, you need to change your mindset, not to feel that you are superior compared to the rest of uh, the citizens in this country. Acknowledge private sectors, bring in a lot of values into the system. That's what I will do. Hello? Okay. So similar to Datuk Satina, my number, well, one is a positive, one is, it's, it's, it's the flip side of the other coin. Number one is capacity building. Because what we found in um, our trust school of the 10 years, if teachers are provided and leaders, school leaders are provided the support and the guidance, and it has to be in school, you know, it can't be just a course touch and go, you go to some bengkel and then you'll magically be able to apply it. It's CPD, so capacity building, but with that support. And then the flip side of that coin is we do not, at the moment, have an effective mechanism for dealing with talent deficit in the system. Yeah, so there's no consequence. Nothing happens to bad people in the system. Thank you. Um, well, if I were the minister, then the first thing I'll do is to change the constitution and ministers will not be from any political party. They would be privately appointed so that there will be no politician involvement. Uh, the second thing I'll do is I will set KPIs for the minister and his team. Um, and one of them would be uh, I agree with the rest, actually teacher training and leadership. I think that will be most important. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, that uh, this is where I know that I, I have learned so much from all of you this evening. Um, I don't have to ask a second question anymore. <laughs> it's so spot on. The nation, every October spent millions of our budget in education. It's not about building up another swimming pool or another football field. It's millions into billions into capacity building, so to say, or teachers, teachers' pays, few hundreds of thousands of teachers. If there is just be under the human resource ministers to transform these teachers, attitudes of the teachers, the value propositions of the teachers, how passionate they should be on the first day why they chose teaching to be their profession, not just another safe job when they retire, they got graduates. 
the world have changed. There is no need for private school that parents have to pay after tax seventy to hundred thousand dollars of school fees every year. The nation would have been better than Singapore or many many nations within Malaysia. Well, suddenly I look forward that uh, all five of you will become our minister. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Asma. Um, I'm just an interested um, person uh, on education. Um, there are a lot of materials I saw outside on the ad, and there are a lot of quantitative data. I'm just wondering, you know, have you ever done a qualitative research project? Um, Identifying key learnings or key, um, yeah, uh, improvement that have been made, you know, so that we know what are some of the uh, issues yeah. that people are grappling with qualitatively. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Asma. Yes, what we have summarized in our uh, books in an in infographic format is the quantity data because that's always easier to present. But having said that, any impact study that we do has qualitative data as well because that is important to triangulate your quantity data. Um, so yes, while most of the uh, you know, reports that we publish focus on the quantity because that's easy to see and, 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 and present, we have a lot of very detailed qualitative uh, studies as well. And not just internally, Trust School Program has been evaluated by external studies as well. So it's not just us beating our own drum. So I'd be very happy to send you some of that qualitative data as well if you're interested. Okay, um, good evening to all the panels. Uh, my name is Nabil Nazmi. I am the uh, ambassador of an NGO called Hunger Hurts. So um, this question is open to all of the panels. I'm quite curious on uh, with, the, with the initiatives um, that are being too focused on the uh, technological advancements. Um, fundamentally speaking, I am uh, curious about how can we inculcate the students with a more balanced, um, moralistic and holistic approach for the, future, for the future education, as well as arts in uh, future education. So thank you. Hi, thanks for that question. Yes, and the Trust School program, as I mentioned earlier, is completely curriculum agnostic. Yes, yeah? so we're not there to teach specific skills. It is about raising student, holistic student outcomes. So engaging them on how to learn making learning fun and exciting so that they can be lifelong learners. We focus on five C's, for example, communication skills, yeah? celebrating coexistence, yes? Um, so a confidence, building confidence. So anyway, I could go on and on and on, but it is about those holistic skills that we focus on. And you know, to be honest, we have schools. We have rural schools, urban schools, orang asli schools. So the aim, an objective is always the same. It's holistic skills, not specific, specific uh, technical skills. I think if I can just add on that, um, you know, I mean, if you if you think about the challenges that we're having right now, like I said earlier, it seemed pretty compounded with so many issues that needs to get tackled. Um, and uh, just to share from Yes and Hasana, we have a lot of programs going into schools uh, that actually focuses on environmental education as well as arts education uh, that is probably getting uh, left behind or forgotten. Uh, and these kids being, you know, tech natives uh, as they call as they are called, um, may forget somewhat or not focused enough 
I think on climate change and all of that, that's a topical issue, but actually our national culture, tradition and heritage. Um, and our experience with students is that with, with at least the current generation of kids being in school, they are actually uh, motivated learners. Uh, and all you need to do is just point them to the right direction. Um, and, and actually they leap uh, in quite admirable ways. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, I think the, the session before this spoke about are we evolving with the times, also with the learners that we are con confronting with. Um, sounds like we're not, I think the doctor was saying that now technology has enabled so many new ways of testing the patient, but in medical school you're still being taught the traditional ways. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with the traditional ways because they are they're married and wisdom to it but i think evolving with the times is something that we need to do so we've we've seen very promising outcomes uh, at co-curricular level actually because obviously we can't do it curricular level, but at co-curricular level the students are doing amazing when they're given the opportunity uh, and when they are being guided the right way to take ownership of learning and experimentation and it's actually been very promising and actually quite heartening to see. Thank, I, I would like to add up, just echo what uh, Shahira was mentioning. Um, actually, I'm, I sit as an advisor for Design for Change Malaysia. I've been with them since uh, 2018. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we brought a group of 60 students to Rome for them to actually showcase their own creation, their own initiatives. These are done by the B40 children from Kelantan, from Terengganu, and uh, from Kedah, mainly, except for a few from Kuala Lumpur. See, what amazing things our students can do when we empower them. I think empowering students to allow them to, basically to harness their talents is one of the most important things. And uh, I think now, Design for Change is also helping the ministry through PPP, actually on live program that we have on Facebook. So some of you can have a look at them, uh, our monthly program whereby that you see students uh, being, uh, actually creating a lot of things on their own and we train them to interview. They are 11 year old students, they could interview big prominent people. So this is what we call as empowerment and at the same time, I think we also need to empower teachers. Uh, being able to actually get the best from the education system, actually empowering teachers, truly allowing them to actually emerge as proper educators, not just teachers, educators and facilitators. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Isa Ismail. I am from the British High Commission. Um, hi Jezreel. We are always in Zoom calls together, but this is the first time we've actually met in person. Um, so your, your explanation by the panel members just now uh, sort of segues quite nicely into the question that I have, um, which is um, about education quality, but also inequality. So we, we're talking about the future and ideally uh, an education system that is shock proof and it's not just about the pandemic, it's any occurrence in the future that would shake up the education landscape, if you will. One topic that we didn't really touch in the panel itself, but through the question and answers, uh, while improving quality is how we address inequality and inclusion. Because uh, I like to think that the future is inclusive, and because uh, the panel members are all women, the future is female, uh, is what I like to say. <laughs> um, and inequality is a big, is arguably, arguably the biggest systemic issue um, we have in, in, in the education sphere. And perhaps that's a different topic for a different day. It's a very big fish to fry. But how do we realistically make sure no one is left behind when we improve quality? Because uh, uh, some of the criticism, uh, because I'm looking at this in, in the economic development point of view, some of the criticism is that we're always uh, designing education, uh, elite designing for the elite. So just to reiterate my question, how do we make sure no one is left behind when uh, in our vision to improve uh, quality? Thank you.
Um, I think I just would like to uh, mention a little bit um, by which you of me being in the Ministry of Education before, and I'm still very much involved with them. I may have a lot of criticism about the Ministry of Education, but notwithstanding that, there are a lot of uh, initiatives lately that they work also with the PPP, whereby they are not just focusing on the elite uh, areas. Actually, we have now, I think we mean what I mean, that the private sectors as well as the ministry, they have gone quite far. As I mentioned just now, design for change, programs that we do actually targeting to B40 mainly about B40 children, and they are just amazing. And I think uh, Shahira and also, uh, I don't know whether Dati and Azimah might be on to say, but they are not focusing on the elite. We go, they all go into the Orang Asli, uh, in Sabah and Sarawak, but they have not done enough. The word for it actually is they've not done enough. You are, you are addressing the issue of equity. Uh, because once upon a time, when they were teaching the Orang Asli, they were using the same syllabus. Then they realize you can't teach the orang asli the same syllabus that we are actually we are setting the same question. So you need to change them because their their scenario, their background are totally different. So you can't put all the eggs in one basket. You need to look at it, you need to address it individually. Thank you. Hi, thanks for that great question. A very complex question. I'll just try and address it as on a superficial level. The way to address equity is to make access to quality education available to all, right? Which is why we are still sticking with this trust school model, because even though at higher education, it's now 50-50 private and public. That's not the case in K-12. In, in primary and secondary, it's only 10% in the private. Now the 10% elite will always be the 10% elite, but 90% of Malaysian children, 5.5 million, are in the public system still. So that's where our focus is. That's where we want to try and have this demonstration model that Shahira uh, talked about so that it can, be, it can cascade into the system more generally. So that's why we need to make that system change so that we can have quality education available for all. wanted to add that I think the, the situation in Malaysia is not really access. I think access is not a problem. I mean, uh, education, at least, I mean, public education is free in the country. But I think uh, the issue for us is inequity in maximizing student potential and so the question on quality. Um, and I think that I mean, for a lot of uh, people in the sector, either private or public or government, for example, a at least I think from the private sector, the frustration is really around maximizing student potential. Um, and if you think, I I I'm not quite sure what the stats are, but I think the ones that are really dropping off after Form 4, I think the number was around 15% or something like that. So like the lost girls and boys kind of thing, right? So they, they kind of drop off just before SPM. And then after SPM, you'll have another layer of drop off, right? Uh, because they didn't do so well for SPM. So those kids, we are seeing them in the communities. Uh, but primary education and at least lower secondary education, the issue is the quality, I think. Because access is there. Mm for at least in, in our situation, in, in Malaysia at least. Yeah. So, um, 4.45, maybe if I can uh, go around the panel to uh, get the panel to have a concluding. Is there any Sorry, I... burning question? Oh, you do. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll hear both the questions and then we'll address it at a go with the closing remarks. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Aisha, uh, together with Dr. Nazima from Page, but also a child advocate. So I'd just like to hang on to what uh, Professor David said in the morning about tapping onto early childhood and early years, as well as Ms. Jazril touching on humanity and humankind. Uh, a lot of words dropped off earlier on about potential, children's potential, and how to increase quality. May I suggest the, inshallah, potential future leadership of um, educational leaders on the stage there. Um, 
I'm talking about inclusion from the female sector. I'm talking about inclusion from children. I uh, attended a webinar yesterday with uh, international bodies uh, talking about children's voices in terms of uh, do they feel safe with this pandemic, uh, online, offline, and um, the workshops that took place, the, the uh, roundtable round table discussions that took place basically honed in eventually at the end of it, saying that the only way for us to really increase quality and making sure the children feel safe, valued, respected, etc., is to focus on children. So at the end of it, uh, they may be, I mean, there were rumblings about talking about ministry for children, like New Zealand, in New Zealand and in Australia, I think, and Scotland. So my question is really, is there a possibility amongst the potential leadership in education in our country? We're talking about future ready uh, education that we will give children more voices. All right? We're not asking for a ministry of children, but we're talking about human development here. Uh, how children survive according to the SDGs, the four areas, development, survival, protection, that adults can help a lot in because we have a lot of experience. But participation is something we do not give our children enough of. We don't give them enough of a voice. We still don't respect them enough. So when we talk about inclusivity and equality, I think we need to empower children more in our classrooms in order for our quality in education also to improve. I hope that's an invitation. I hope the answer is an yes. a yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more last. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Nazira. I'm from Hunger Heads, Malaysia. So my question, I'll make it very, very brief. So I am very curious, since we want to produce uh, more quality graduates uh, in order to support our economic growth, so why don't we put the educative development or the work ethic culture in the first day of the degree instead of putting it at the very end, which is the practicum? And uh, so that the graduates will be, more, uh, will be well prepared into uh, supplying the demands or fulfilling the demands from the working world. Thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, why are we not training uh, graduates to be prepared for the workplace while they are in university rather than doing it at the end? And, and I think um, I wanted to just give a short comment on that because uh, Kazana and I think quite a lot of government-linked companies uh, have always been tasked to look at graduate unemployability uh, schemes and programs. Um, and, and one of the kind of mystery is that why is it that after spending uh, 12 years or whatever in school and another three, four years in university, they have to come out and do another nine months or whatever to learn how to ace an interview or write a resume and so on and so forth. Um, but essentially, that's what it is. And so, you know, I think some uh, higher learning institutions uh, are now incorporating that. I know some schools have something called the finishing school, like just before you graduate. But actually, these skills should be embedded, right? Um, and, 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 I, and, and I think that, uh, I mean, from my own personal learning experience in higher education, uh, I do learn quite a lot from my professors who are practitioners. Uh, some of my part-time lecturers or adjuncts that come in and, <laughs> and teach because they are, they are speaking from real life experiences and all of that. So I think the, the diversity of experiences from your teaching cohorts, I think, helps a lot to, to kind of ground. Uh, but, but yeah, your, uh, your, your question is, is a good one. We may not have an answer, but perhaps something that we can do better um, in equipping the graduates uh, to be a lot more employable in that sense. But yep, so we're wrapping up. We're running out of time. Uh, can I start with that? Um, to your question, Aisha, I think... Um, um, I think it was a lot worse, say, 10, 20 years ago when uh, children would be say, put in a corner, make them stand on a chair as punishment. Now, you know, uh, teachers aren't allowed to do that to students anymore, although it does happen occasionally. 
but I think um, I think we're more uh, focused about student-centered education. Although, um, well, the ministry says that, but um, whether teachers believe in it is a different matter altogether. But I think the teachers have to be reminded that. Um, stu the students' voice has have to be heard, and I think more and more advocates for the student, uh, ensuring that um, uh, students the vo students' voice is heard. Um, and uh, to the other question, I think it it is tough. Um, I too have children who are working. I've got a son who's in between jobs, and uh, you know they are always having to uh, be agile and having to do extra to secure that job. So it didn't used to be um, my time. You know, you just have a degree, you, a job is waiting for you, but it's not like that anymore. You, you know, and the higher you go with the masters, it's even more difficult to get a job, unfortunately. So that's the way it is. And it's, it's tough being a, being a job seeker nowadays. Thank you. Um, I just would like to answer the question just now, if I may. On the uh, internship Required, at the yeah. end of the programs, for example, in the studies, yeah. Actually, it, the uh, we have uh, what we call the structured internship program, uh, where students go to the uh, industry, which is uh, earlier during the semesters. We have also the structured industry attachment program or SIAP program, you know where the students go actually uh, alternate semesters. We have co-op programs. So there are many uh, models of internship that are being introduced, not only being introduced, but there are uh, universities are running it right now, conducting it. So, but we hope that we will have more uh, programs or more universities uh, uh, to uh, work on this type of model for them to choose. Thank you. I think I just want to uh, just wrap up a little bit what I said. Um, one thing, there are two things that I want to say. One thing that, that for sure, the system that is going on now, the education system before, is not going to exist anymore. The way students learn going to change tremendously. There's no more going to be traditional way. It was mentioned this morning. It's going to be blended learning or whichever way that it's going to be. Evaluation, assessment will need to change. That is one thing. Therefore. To, to enable that to happen, teachers' role will not be teachers anymore. They need to be educators, not just teachers, educators and facilitators. And uh, one thing that I missed out just now when I was talking about PPP in relation to this as well, if we were to actually allow uh, PPP to be enhanced properly, we also need to talk about uh, sustainability, like the trust school program. If they come in for five years, ten years, whatever it is, what next? After they leave, what will happen? So between the both parties, uh, the stakeholders, they need to really talk about this. How do we continue with whatever uh, continuation that can be done? So therefore, I, I, I emphasize one more time, uh, allow teachers to be trained, to be retrained, and use and leverage on the PPP models so that the Ministry of Education do not, they don't need to actually come up with extra uh, too much of money to use. Thank you. Okay, I just want to close and wrap up and address uh, Aisha's question. I don't think we need a Ministry of Children. What on earth is the Ministry of Education about if it doesn't have the interests of children at its heart? Yeah, and so I go back to our theory of change. Student outcomes must be at the center. A key feature of the Trust School program is a student voice group. We have a platform. Uh, and the ultimate aim is about student agency, making, empowering students to take ownership of their own learning. That is the end goal nowadays for education. And I think what the pandemic has kind of underlined is how teacher-centered we actually are. So we have to reduce that dependence. If students are more independent, if they are independent learners, then they will be able to adapt and adjust so much easily compared to having this dependence on you know, spoon feeding and teacher-centered learning. And in order to do that, the system has to come with us. As Dr. Satina says, sustainability has to be there. Because the trust school program, we don't 
manage a trust school forever. We go in now, the new model, it's three years max. But then what we do is hopefully we've changed enough within the school and the system can keep it going. Thank you. And I think I'd just like to end with um, the fact that I feel that the system will never be equal, but it has to be fair. So I think a fair system means that uh, at least there is a chance for students, especially those who are in rural areas or around Asli, to, to, to have the opportunity to, ex to be exposed to good quality teachers. Because somebody earlier, a participant, talked about incentive. Incentivize good teachers, pay them a bit more to go to those rural schools allow the students, allow the Orang Asli kids to be exposed to really good teacher. That's the way we can be fair. Otherwise, they will always just stay at the bottom and just receive mediocre um, exposure. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the session. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the panelists. If we could just give them a round of applause. Um, so we, let's all leave. I think I like the, that quality of education was the last session, a subject that each and every one of us are very passionate about. Uh, and, um, you know, I would say that let's use this opportunity of disruption. I think don't let a pandemic go to waste in that sense. Um, and uh, think about your own spheres of influence, whether you are advocating for teachers, students, system, um, content, uh, technology, what can you do to help with the reset uh, that potentially we will be looking at in terms of what education will look like in the future. So thank you very much. I hope you've had a great day. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.